So one of the things that we talk about in terms of optimizing wealth and creating wealth is not so much about what you're making, but it's also what you're keeping that it's important. And this is what we're going to talk about a lot today about some of the tax strategies, some of the tax opportunities, some of the deductions, some of the expenses that you could be saving, some of the exposures in order to empower yourself, your family, and your business, and your employees, and the community as a whole as well. So I'm going to dive right in into the discussion. I hope you're going to get a lot of value and resources from today's conversation. So uh, welcome to the Proactive Tax Planning Ideas for Business Owners and Entrepreneurs. And entrepreneurs like us certainly recognize that it's not just about what you make, as I was mentioning. It's about what you keep that counts. So one of the main goals in the conversation today, and as financial professionals in general, is to help individuals like you and business owners like you keep more, retain more, and then recognize some of the tax deductions or reduction of opportunities within your business, right? So that causes your investment to grow and accumulate, and also overall building and growing and distributing wealth in a more ideal and optimal ways. So staying current in the ever-changing tax environment is very important. It's a key component to help you keep more and benefit from the tax reductions opportunities. So that the objective of today is to really share those opportunities that could be effective if you consider it and implemented it properly. So that's the main theme for the workshop today proactive approach to planning instead of re reactive approach, which could, which could optimize your results. So a little disclaimer here, uh, keep in mind that this workshop is not a substitute for uh, using a tax professional or a CPA or an accountant or legal professionals. And another thing to consider is that many states do not follow the same rules and computations as the federal income tax rule. So make sure that you check with your tax professionals or legal professionals to see what tax rates and rules apply and available in your states particularly. So today's agenda is pretty straightforward. What we're gonna do is we're gonna review some of the tax planning strategies. And while we're doing so, we're gonna discuss other opportunities and ideas that you could consider for your own personal and business situation. We truly believe that educating clients and business owners on their choices so they can make informed and educated decisions. That's the goal today is to give you an overview about proactive tax planning, that when you look at your business opportunities, your tax situation, you can have some strong fundamental information that you could implement. So remember, each taxpayer situation is very unique. And so look at your situation individually, but the good news is that we're here, we're available to help you review it and, um, and assess, evaluate the specifics of your situation. So let's talk about some of the five key areas of financial planning. And most people, what you wanna know that most people plan only for growth, but they don't really, appropriately plan for risk management or income planning or distribution planning. And we find that it's very important, as we mentioned before, it's not about what we make, it's about what we get to keep the accounts, that it's very important to address all of the key areas of planning. And those are some of the key areas. You have fundamental, fund, foundation planning or preservation planning, which is you know, having all of the proper structures for your business, managing risks and exposures and potential liabilities, having investment planning properly, growth and fee management on your investments, whether it's real estate, real estate or stocks or bonds or mutual funds, or other extensions of your business. Then you have the income planning or retirement planning. Income planning could be the distribution planning, which is passive income strategies for the future. And then you have tax planning strategies and estate planning strategies. And some of those 
are connected, even though we're going to talk mostly about tax planning today, which about what you get to keep, but it also going to affect your distribution planning, your income planning. Some of it would affect your investment planning and then succession or exit strategies in terms of estate planning as well. So we, as a comprehensive firm, we consider the impact of any and all of those recommendations that we make, not just one, because those areas are very, very important and it will impact your bottom line. So a couple of things to remember in terms of the different types of acts that were implemented in 2021 and 2019 and 2020. And we're also potentially gonna deal with uh, a new change in 2021 or 2022. So you have the SECURE Act that uh, was signed into law in 2019 and then the 2020 CARE Act, which added new laws and rules for taxpayers like us, right? And with the new administration, it's really helpful to consider some of the tax proposals that are going to be discussed or going to be implemented so you can properly and proactively plan. So let's talk about and distinguish the differences between tax planning and tax preparation. So tax planning essentially is really looking ahead before we get to the year end, right? What do we typically do as business owners and entrepreneurs, right? As in individuals in general, you know, we, we as human beings, we typically procrastinate. But, you know, where tax planning is proactively planning before year end and tax preparation is filing out the tax form in retrospect or after year end. And it's sometimes it's very difficult to make changes um, after the fact. So this conversation today about tax planning and not preparation, it's going to include some of the strategies, uh, unique deductions that you have available to you, uh, unique ways to accumulate a significant amount of wealth, also defer it to the future, and then distribution. So when you take money out, you're also going to have tax advantages as well. Um, and those ideas are very, very valuable for business owners and entrepreneurs and individuals like us. And Benjamin Franklin said, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. And so that's something really, really important that uh, we want to do is plan ahead. So let me give you a quick overview of some of the tax brackets for 2021. You still have about seven tax rates. And there are 10%, 12%, 22%, 24%, 32, 35, and 37. And depending on whether you're single or married, your income gets calculated progressively into those brackets. So, you know, and the, the Tax Cuts and Job Act is scheduled to automatically phase out in January 1st, 2026 which might affect those types of structures. And so that's something you wanna keep in mind in the future. So for 2021, another thing to remember, the standard tax deduction amounts are 12,550 for individuals. It's 25,100 for married couples filing jointly and surviving spouses. And then, it's 12,550 for married couple filing separately, and then 18,800 for heads of household. Now, here is another chart to kind of share with you the what bracket management is all about. So on the left side, you see the current tax rates for single filers. And on the right side, you can see that married filing jointly generally has a lower tax rate. So, you know, some people actually consider if they're in a relationship, um, what's the tax situation is like, and, and sometimes they actually make changes in order to benefit from those tax changes. For planning purposes, something you need to remember is that even if there's no changes are made to tax rates, in 2026, the new law says that we're going to go back to the older, higher rates. And tax brackets are important and current tax law call for its sunset in 2026, as we mentioned, which will go back to higher rates. So 
proactively planning would be very, very important for you to do because for some people, that means income that would be taxed at 25% today, it could be taxed at 26, in 2026 at 33%, a much higher rate. So, you know, therefore, you have a loss of, of potential income and, and you retain less in your pocket. So how should you view itemized deduction if you don't take the standard deduction, right? So the old rule was to accelerate or realize deduction and then take them as soon as possible, right? But with the highest standard deduction, the new rule is not so much to uh, accelerate or realize deductions, but it's to time it or plan it properly. Two of the um, widespread deductions that taxpayers look at if they choose to itemize and not use the standard deductions, typically there are mortgage interest and what's called SALT or state and local taxes. So under the new rules, right, mortgages taken after October 1987 and before December 2017, the mortgage interest is fully deductible up to the first million dollars of mortgage debt. And then that change or has been lowered uh, for the first 750,000 or 375,000, depending on whether you're married filing separately, um, on homes purchased after December 15, 2017. So for those of you here with mortgages or large medical expenses, what you want to do, you want to check with the tax professional for how much deductions you could take for this year and how much you should itemize in order to see which one is more beneficial for you, standard deductions or itemized deductions. The uh, TCGA also limited tax and local income, sales and real personal property taxes to a maximum deductions of $10,000. So if you capped at $10,000, you know, you wanna differentiate whether itemized or standard deductions would be more beneficial for you. Another thing, um, if you're charitably inclined to consider what's called bunching contribution. So here's an illustration here to show you how some of those things work. Uh, essentially, if you skip some years, if you're uh, someone who's married filing jointly and had $10,000 in state and local taxes, which would include your property taxes, and then $5,000 of mortgage interest, and you give $10,000 to charity, then you would have itemized deductions of about $25,000. You can see it on the graph on the far left. But let's look at an example where the standard deduction for you would be, um, you know, 24,400, 24, which you're gain about $600 by itemizing in a 35% federal tax bracket, you're gonna have about $210 a year after tax savings, right? So if you did that for three years, you would gain about $630. But what if you did it alternatively, where you gift $30,000 in one year and you use the standard deduction in year two and three? What that would do, it would bring your deductions to $45,000 in year one and then save you about $7,210 over the standard deduction in year one at 35% tax rate. And by doing so, you would lose the additional $210 in tax savings from two, year two and three, but you would receive um, a much larger um, benefit of 7,210, uh, which essentially you'll save extra $6,580 more. So, and you might be thinking, well, $30,000 is a lot of money to give in, in one year. Uh, so there's something actually that's called Donor Advised Fund or DAF, 
which you get the deduction immediately, and then you give the charitable contribution. And as you see fit, you can see this on the right, the illustration of how that works. So if you have any questions about that particularly, uh, you can reach out to us. But it's very important to know that you have an option instead of paying taxes in order to get a deduction, you can contribute it and use a charity of your choice to, um, to give you a deduction. Here is another uh, charitable opportunities. Um, something new in 2020 is a charitable deduction that is available to you if you didn't itemize your deductions. It's a new benefit that is called the universal deduction. And what it does, it allows you to get uh, above the line deduction um, and get additional $300 per individual or $600 for married couple uh, filing jointly. And then in order to qualify, that charitable gift must be either cash or cash equivalent made to a qualified charity like a 501c3. Um, and it has to be done before 1231-2021. This um, can be taken before you calculate your adjusted gross income. So speak to your CPA or your accountant uh, in order to see if this is something that you want to use, utilize. Another charitable given opportunity for you is a, a good strategy for retirement savers. So as part of the SECURE Act, the required minimum distributions or the RMD was actually changed. It used to be that you, you had to take it before 70 and a half or at 70 and a half rather. Now they delayed it or defer it to 72. And also, if you would like to defer some of, your, some of your required minimum distribution even longer, you could defer a portion of it till the age of 85 by creating a plan called QLAC, or Qualified Longevity Annuity Contract. What it does, this year, you could defer $135,000 or 25% of your IRA value, whichever is less. So um, qualified charitable distributions are provision that allows your, uh, as a retirement saver over the age of 70 and a half, to distribute $100,000 to eligible charity directly from your retirement account and not pay taxes on that distribution. Why is it important? Because if you plan to get income in your retirement, if your income is pushing you into higher tax brackets, which most people plan that they'll be in a lower tax bracket in the future, then this opportunity could be extremely valuable because it could keep you um, managing your brackets properly. Again, like all of the other strategies that we talk about today, uh, you want to see what is appropriate for your personal situation. If you want to advise with your accountants or CPA, um, or advise with one of our accountants and CPAs, uh, we can definitely make that available to you. So here are some of the capital gain rates for 2021. So for long-term capital gains, you still receive a tax break, right? For single, for married, for um, filing jointly, for head of household, you can see you have a 0% uh, and you have that level. And then it goes into... 15% and then it goes for 20% depending on, on your income. One of the planning items that many taxpayers might consider is tax gains and loss harvesting. Very, very important in terms of capital gains. Uh, there's other ways for us to plan for capital gains. There's something called ESOPs, which will able to convert your taxable income and taxable entities into non-taxable entities. That's something that we individually work with our clients to create if their business structure is appropriate for that. But um, harvesting capital losses is a strategy that taxpayers generally sell in assets that are at a loss to offset the capital gain and to minimize or reduce the capital gains. And what it does, it's um, keep more money in your pocket because you have, it's like a teeter-totter. On the surface, right, 
you might think that loss harvesting produces an economic benefit equal to the tax save, but sometimes uh, it could only provide the timing benefit. And so this is what we look at it as, as a tax deferral strategy that could be super valuable for you. Capital gain losses, capital gain and losses are generally a very effective strategies if it could be used to offset uh, some of your income that is taxed at a higher rate. Also, a lot of times we look at tax credits and incentives. Sometimes you have federal tax credits and incentives. Sometimes you have local tax credits and incentives. Uh, you should really be aware of what's available for you. Um, a key thing to remember that you can use up to $3,000 in the capital gain losses above the gains to offset your ordinary income. A lot of times what our clients do is also use real estate structures to push depreciation early on to offset some of their income tax liabilities as well. One of the quick warning that I wanna mention, uh, you wanna consider the what's called the wash sale rule. And what it, this rule, what it does, it prevents taxpayers from repurchasing a substantially similar security within 30 days of selling at a loss. So that could be problematic for you because you cannot claim those deductions. So if you have any questions about losses or gain harvesting, let us know and we can certainly um, help you evaluate that. To harvest or deferred, that is really the question. And so it depends on your personal situation. Like I mentioned, that's something we could uh, provide some insights for you. So in a minute, what we're going to do is talk about some of the new tax policy proposals, but uh, this is really important. It's very timely uh, to look at recent tax proposals that it's about capital gain rates and, and how are those things are going to change? How is it gonna affect all of us and as business owners and entrepreneurs? And with this proposal, are to eliminate the preferential rates for long-term capital gains and qualify dividends on income over a million dollars. And you might think, oh, that's not gonna affect me, but economically, we could all be affected. It's a, it's a significant proposal and a really fundamental shift because capital gains has never before been eliminated for any taxpayers. And this proposal for those affected basically is going to increase the, the rate from 20% to 39.6%, essentially doubling the tax liabilities. So if, if that's going to be enacted, then um, at today's lower rate, some people potentially would sell assets and businesses and stocks uh, in order to avoid paying higher rates. So let's look at how it works, right? In uh, 2017, we had three rates for long-term capital gains and qualified dividends. You can see it on the left, uh, 0, 15, and 20. And you can see how broad the 20% category is. Uh, in 2020, there's still three rates for long-term capital gains. And you can see how the 20% um, it had uh, narrowed and the 15% had broadened. And then in 2022, again, nobody know for sure, but what it could happen, it, they could bring four rates for long-term capital gains. And therefore we need to continue to follow the, the law changes and proposal to see you know, what's the new reality is going to be. So remember to review your year-end retirement contribution planning. It could mean a significant deduction for you. If you're a high income earner and you're paying more than $20,000 in taxes, um, you can take advantage of retirement structures that can offer really large deductions, much larger, larger than, than traditional IRAs or Roth IRAs or SEP IRAs. Uh, for larger deductions and wealth accumulation, what we do many of the time for our business owners who are qualified, we create what's called a defined benefit pension plan. 
And what we could do, it could give you additional deductions of anywhere from $100,000 to $400,000 a year, sometimes even more. Um, it could include future healthcare benefits, um, depending on your age and your income. It could accumulate an extraordinary amount of money for you. If you think about that 10 year structure, if you save, you know, $100,000, that's over a million dollars of deductions. Um, and the limit there is about $3.6 million of a pool of money that you can deduct with growth and um, projected uh, accumulation. So if you want to learn more about if your business qualify or if you're qualified for a plan like that, please reach out to us and, and let us know if you have any questions. So here is some of the contribution plan maximums that could be applicable if you're participating in one of those retirement plans. Another critical area to review before year end because of the SECURE Act is what we refer to as your overall family tax bracket management. Well, logically speaking, if you're in a higher tax bracket, then your beneficiary or your kids or your um, heirs, then it might make sense for you to let them take distribution after your passing, right? If this is money that you're not gonna need to use for yourself, then you could have a succession plan to transfer that liability to the next generation. And we have, we can show you some ways that uh, you have plans that we create a liquidity fund to pay those taxes for them, but they will pay it for lower tax bracket. Um, but if your beneficiary is gonna be in a higher tax bracket, then they might make more sense to take distribution in your personal tax bracket before passing. And then you can convert some of those accounts to a Roth IRA. Sometimes we do a backdoor Roth if you have traditional IRAs um, and leave your beneficiary in an account that it might be taken out in 10 years, but can grow tax free. Okay, there's also something to consider whether those assets are gonna be uh, step up in basis or not, whether they're real estate asset or not. That's something we can talk to you more about. Some of the benefits from Roth IRA conversions could lower your overall taxable income in the long term. Roth IRAs enjoy tax-free compounding interest and growth. Roth IRAs have no required minimum distributions at age 72, like a traditional IRA, you would have to take money at 72, which could push your tax bracket upward. So you don't have to deal with that with a Roth. And then also it allows tax-free withdrawals from your beneficiaries as well, not just for you, but also for your beneficiaries. Another thing to consider is education saving plan, um, or also known as 529s, uh, both for perhaps your kids or for grandkids, because some of those can qualify for deferral and tax-free distribution as long as it's used for qualified education expenses. And some of those are not generally just the school itself. It could be for books, it could be for board. There's other things that you can use it for as long as it's qualified. And also another thing to consider is it is transferable to somebody else as well. If the, your child or grandkid did not use it, uh, you could transfer it for somebody else in the family. So let's talk a little bit about annual gifting. Today, you might be able to gift about $15,000 a year tax-free to each donee in this year, 2021. And this annual exclusion gift do not reduce your lifetime gift tax exemption, which is quite high. Um, it's, um, it's over $5 million today. And the exclusion gift is doubled to $30,000 per donee if you're um, a couple, married couple. Um, and you can do that pretty much for as many people as you want to, right? For each one of your kids or even grandkids or other people that you care about. Those are opportunities to give an unlimited tax-free gift. 
And if you pay the provider of services directly, uh, or if you use medical expenses, uh, it has to meet the definition of deductible medical expenses. And also we talked about before qualified education expenses, like tuition, books, fees, and other related expenses. And then you can also find the detailed qualification on the IRS site. Um, it's um, section and form 709. Then your accountants can help you with that as well. Uh, something to consider about succession and wealth transfer planning is an exemption amount for either gifting your estate and generation tax skipping for 2020 to 2025. So between those years is 11 million 58 um, as, as, um, as a limit and 23 million for married couples. So it's quite substantial. And there was one year that it was unlimited. And in previous years, it was quite low. Uh, if you looked at like 15, 20 years ago, uh, if you were transferring assets of over 600, 700, $800,000, uh, you would be taxed heavily. So if you had a home or IRAs or business, um, anything above that value or, or your net worth could be taxed at 30, 40, 50%. Um, today, that any amount that is over that 11 million or 23 million that I was mentioning is taxed at 40%. But what you want to remember that this is going to sunset at 2026, uh, which will go to the 5.49 million uh, for adjusted for inflation. So um, it, it's, you know, this could be significantly. Uh, impacting you because if you have a home or some investment properties or your business, which you know the IRS typically would value it at a greater amount that you would value it because that means more revenue for the IRS. So this is something that you definitely want to keep in mind because it's not only taxes on the money that you're making today, but also the money that you will transfer to the next generation as well. And that's a different types of tax. So here's, let's talk about some of those changes that we mentioned earlier uh, and some others. So those could be future changes that has to be approved by, by Congress, but to help you think about planning and your future strategies, um, here is some of the highlights of those. The, the uh, proposed plan is to increase corporate tax rates from 21% to 28%. Also to increase the marginal tax rate for top earners from 37% to 39.6%. Additionally, to raise the capital gain tax on filing with income over a million dollars to 39%, essentially doubling. Um, Another thing that might happen is the itemized deduction would be limited uh, even more. Um, and there's a cap that is proposed to itemized deduction of 28%. So what that means that each dollar of itemized deductions, including charitable contribution, a taxpayer or a couple filing jointly would only receive maximum benefit of 20 cent on a dollar if you're paying higher marginal tax rate. So if you're in a 40% rate and you maxed deduction at 28, that's not beneficial for you. And also there's a, a phase out for small business income deduction for those earning over $400,000. There's a proposal to eliminate the step up in basis. Um, and step up in basis is the cost basis for typically property or assets that are transferable to an heir upon passing. So if, for an example, you have a home that you bought for $300,000, but it was worth $600,000 at the time of passing, today the heirs would pay capital gains on anything over that $600,000 right, if the home was, was ever sold, if the uh, kids or the family sold the home. 
but if the proposal uh, become law, the heirs would not inherit that step up in basis, the cost basis, and would have to pay taxes on anything over uh, what you bought it for, which was the $300,000. So it could mean a significant impact and a tax bill for the family. So um, reducing the state tax exemption uh, to 3.5 million immediately. So um, that's something that um, could affect a lot of people. And then, so every, every, everything over the 3.5 million could be taxed at essentially 40%. Um, but, you know, obviously this is a proposal at this point, but that's the key point about proactive planning, because if you do it in a higher tax exemptions and deduction opportunity, you'll save yourself a lot of challenges in the future. So to summarize, here are some of the items that you should review prior to year end uh, and proactively plan for. So what is your tax bracket today? How do you manage and stay beneath that next tax bracket? Sometimes just $1 would move you into the uh, higher tax bracket, right? So you, you wanna make sure that you're uh, using deductions, using retirement structures, using uh, deferrals, using some uh, depreciations from real estate and all of those things that we mentioned, harvesting. Um, do you take standard or itemized deductions to time your gains or losses properly, to gain a deferral? Um, to you, you, are you maximizing your deductions on a private pension plan that you created in your business to get a hundred plus thousand dollars a year, or are you only using IRAs that gives you a deduction of maybe six thousand dollars a year, or maximum uh, fifty something thousand a year? So you, you want to look at it to see what's proper for your situation. Do you have education planning opportunities? Do you have charitable gifting and planning opportunities? Um, and then what is your overall estate and succession plan? Do you plan to sell the business and trigger capital gain? Or you can utilize a tool like ESOPs and sell the business internally and then eliminate or reduce significantly the capital gain, um, the, the liability and exposure. And it's also very important to plan for all of the other major financial and investments and real estate uh, tax situations because it all affects your bottom line. And, um, and this is something that we can bring opportunities for you in terms of deductions, accumulation, growth, and distributions. So I hope you find this valuable, today's discussion. And... As a token of appreciation, what we want to do at Raise the Bar Financial Group is offer you a complimentary tax and financial efficiency evaluation to see if you're taking advantage of the opportunities that you have available to you. También, Natalia, me gustaría hacerlo en español, comentarle a todos nuestros amigos empresarios latinos, hispanos, que obviamente también hablamos español y que la consulta sin costo eh, puede ser también en español, si es que así se sienten mejor. Y con gusto estamos para ayudarlos. Eh, nos pueden encontrar en la página de uh, www.rtv financial group y se pueden ir a la sección de eh, team y ahí están nuestros datos. Eh, estamos a sus órdenes. Ojalá eh, podamos ayudarlos eh, en un futuro próximo.